why are you going to Georgia? I, I think everyone knows, but what made you decide to do this? Well, uh, I uh, was campaigning for Joe this last number of uh, months, and then uh, his ability to get things through Congress is going to be determined on January 5th in Georgia. So it really did not make that much sense to me uh, to be campaigning for Joe and celebrating Joe's victory and then stopping there um, when you could potentially make it so that he can actually pass laws that help people. So I thought, well, what can I do to help? And I was like, well, I, I, I actually have a number of friends and uh, relationships in Georgia. Uh, the state is 4.7% Asian American. Um, so I thought I might be able to help uh, get that vote out. Um, so I thought, well, let me go campaign there. Uh, and so I talked to my wife about it and she was down to, at first I was like, am I gonna go down there alone and then try and come back and forth? But then uh, Evelyn said that she agreed with me that it was the most important thing going on. Uh, and so when she said, let's go down there as a family, I said, great, that, that makes my, that like lightens my heart. Um, so we then had to find a place and make arrangements, uh, but that's why we're heading down there. So if you wanna help in Georgia, go to winbothseats.org or go to the John Ossoff or Reverend Warnock uh, campaign page and uh, help out because who wants Mitch McConnell blocking legislation for the next two to four years? Not me. So if you don't want that either, help us out in Georgia. Well, let's talk about that, you know, because a lot of people do talk, Andrew, about the idea of divided government, you know, checks and balances, et cetera. But clearly you b don't believe in that philosophy. Um, you know, why do you think that's not a good thing? I know I'm being rhetorical here, but I just would like to hear your perspective. Sure, Katie. Uh, I, in the abstract, like the idea of uh, bipartisan government and people compromising and reaching across the aisle uh, and coming to terms. But we have to acknowledge that DC has not been functioning like that for quite some time and that we are still in crisis mode. You have over 10 million Americans who've lost their jobs that aren't coming back. You, had, you probably saw that story about just food lines for miles and, and the rest of it. So in this context, with this Congress, where Mitch McConnell uh, has made such a clear uh, habit of obstructing useful legislation, I mean, he's even signaled that he might not uh, approve cabinet secretaries, which uh, you know, is, is a further impediment to a functioning government. So given what's going on right now in DC, uh, it's clear to me that a unified government would improve our ability to respond to the crisis. Um, but in an ideal world, like I think that uh, bipartisan government uh, governing together would be uh, optimal. It's just we haven't seen that in gosh knows how long at this point. You know, no, I, nobody can get into Mitch McConnell's head necessarily. And I talked to Bill Crystal about this, Andrew, yesterday. I mean, why are so many Republicans resisting kind of recognizing uh, a, a secure, fair, accurate election uh, right now and, and, and are not, you know, you can really, you can on one hand name the Republicans who have called Joe Biden and congratulated him or even acknowledged the fact that he is the president elect. It's political, Katie, where Donald Trump has had a death grip or stranglehold on the party uh, since 2016. And right now, the vast majority of Republican voters still uh, love Donald Trump and no other Republican, uh, not no other, I mean, a few, like you said, have, have been uh, more principled, uh, but no one wants to inflame Trump supporters against them. Uh, there are folks who say, look, we need Trump's voters in Georgia on January 5th. Uh, and, and so it's more politically favorable, they believe, to go along with the contested election narrative uh, and Donald Trump's uh, failure to concede than it is to say, look, this election ended, Joe's the president elect, let's get on with it. Isn't it interesting that, that so many people are cowering uh, about, you know, in, in terms of the notion of being singled out, sing, singled out on Twitter or incurring the wrath of, of huge Trump supporters that they, they can't have the principles to basically recognize one of our, you know, most important democratic institutions. It's kind of mind boggling, isn't it? It's destructive and corrosive too, Katie, because there are real costs to this. I mean, you have the president-elect trying to figure out 
uh, how to take over these agencies. And then they're not allowed to talk to the people who are currently running the agencies. Uh, I mean, they're, they're real costs. The fact that uh, I believe 50% of Republicans don't think that this was a free and fair election uh, will erode our trust in vote counts moving forward. So, so this is not a small deal. It's a very big deal. Um, and it's being made big by the fact that there has been very, very little in the way of Republicans coming out and saying, look, uh, Joe Biden got more votes. He's the president-elect. Let's congratulate him and let's try and do the country's business. I want to talk a, a more about sort of your role on a national stage. But first, I, just getting back to Georgia for a second, Andrew, um, are you worried that people are not going to mo be motivated to go out and vote in these in the Senate runoff because Trump is not on the ballot. And that was a huge motivating factor in November for both mail-in ballots and in-person voting. So without that kind of to, to spur people on, how concerned are you about turnout? I think that Democrats have an uphill battle in Georgia, despite the fact that the state just tipped to Joe because of what you just described, Katie. There are many, many people in Georgia who think that the election was in November <laughs> and they have no idea that there are these special election runoffs in January. It's not customary for us to vote in January. Uh, it's one reason I'm heading down there is to let folks know that this vote is as important as the last vote. Uh, and historically in Georgia, Republican turnout has been significantly higher in these special elections than Democratic turnout. Now, times might have changed in Georgia. Like, uh, you know, there's no reason to think that we can't, um, compete and win. Uh, but you have to acknowledge that the terrain is likely favoring Republicans because there are many folks who don't know that January 5th is voting day and they might not, um, they might, so there, there are a handful of people that couldn't register uh, for the November election that turned 18 that could register for this one. Uh, so we should be notifying high school seniors <laughs> like uh, around the state and be like, hey, if you turned 18, uh, you can register by December 7th. Is that what you're doing? I mean, where are you going to concentrate your efforts? Are you going to be focused on urban areas in terms of turnout, rural areas that seem to lean more Republican to try to convert some of those folks? Where are you going to really uh, target your efforts? So I have three events on the docket so far. Um, one is uh, for high school Democrats because of what we just described and young people. Another is with Asian American groups. Uh, another is with uh, WNBA. Um, uh, set of athletes. Uh, one of the Republican senators actually owns the local WNBA team, which is its own source of controversy. You probably know about, <laughs> about how some of the players are not very excited about her, uh, her ownership. Um, I, I have at least one trip scheduled into a rural area. Um, and, and so, you know, I, 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 it's, it's fun, Katie, in this figure um, where you go to Georgia and you announce you're going like I did. Uh, and then your team starts to uh, connect with people or people reach out to us uh, and then you find ways to activate voters and make yourself useful. That's been one of the glorious things about my campaign where, you know, I mean, you and I actually met uh, socially uh, before uh, like all of this um, and I was an anonymous figure. And so like, if I went somewhere, like, you know, it wasn't going to have much of an impact. Uh, but n now um, uh, I feel like I can actually make a difference for sets of voters in a lot of different places. Somebody just asked if uh, on, on this feed if uh, you would want, well, first someone said, Andrew Yang, you're so cool. So just to, just to kind of uh, stroke your ego there for a moment. But what about Secretary of Commerce or being in Joe Biden's cabinet? Is that something that is of interest to you? Have you been approached about this by anyone? And tell me how you're feeling about that possibility. I'm on the record, Katie, that if I have an opportunity to contribute uh, in Joe's administration, uh, I will very, very seriously consider it because you don't run for president and then walk away from a chance to contribute to solving some of the problems you ran on. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, my ability to have an impact one way or another moving forward and being part of Joe's administration would be a, a privilege. If you uh, had to I, come for ideal job, what would it be? You know, I, I think there are three things that I ran on that I'm very passionate about that I think I could, I could help with. Uh, number one is trying to humanize the economy. Uh, we need to redefine it so it's around like how families are doing and not how the stock market is doing. Uh, number two is tech, which is we are way behind on social media and uh, AI and other issues that are becoming more and more pressing. I mean, I love the fact that you and I can have this conversation, but we have to acknowledge that 
social media has as many uh, drawbacks as positives, uh, particularly for a democracy and for the mental health of our kids and like a bunch of other things. And then the, the, the third thing is around uh, the future of work, recognition of work, caregiving uh, as work. I'm very passionate about that given um, my, my wife and uh, our family's uh, circumstances. So those are some of the big things that I ran on that I would love to help with. Yeah, well, why don't you describe sort of your personal story and what it is about, uh, you know, caregiving that has made you feel so passionately about it? Well, my wife and I have two boys who are eight and five, and the older uh, boy is autistic, um, which we realized when he was almost four. Uh, it was a real relief in some ways. Uh, and my, my wife... Uh, understood that our son needed something more uh, relatively early on. Uh, and so uh, he's been going to a special school and, and my wife's been like the CEO of uh, his um, care development education. And it's so much work. Uh, I can't imagine um, families around the country and single parents in particular having to go through this and, and not have the support that they need and deserve. Uh, so that's one of the things that pushed me to run, Katie, was I saw what my family was going through. And I and know that we are very, very fortunate. There are two of us. We have resources. Uh, you know, we, we can help. Um, and it was still such a, a, a monumental uh, lift. Uh, you know, like, I think being a parent is a lift no matter what. Um, but seeing what Evelyn has done uh, gave me, like, a very, very direct and personal sense of what, parents and single parents in particular go through. Well, that, that's, uh, you know, I think when you're really impacted on a personal level, I think it gives you such a deeper, more profound perspective on an issue and is so motivating. So I really appreciate your getting to this place and wanting to help so many people in your family's position. But as you point out, Andrew, mm -hmm. and, you know, with more more challenging circumstances. And I just want to pick up on the one other thing you said about one of the things that you care deeply about is social media. You know, I've been thinking a lot about truth decay as uh, I think the Rand Corporation described it in 2018. We've heard President Obama talk a lot about it recently. And uh, that is the fact that there's so much misinformation and how, you know, I think President Obama talked about how that is a, such a threat to democracy. But when I think about solutions, everyone says, well, what can you do about that? What can you do about the addictive nature of social media or how it affects children's, uh, you know, uh, self-image and all the negative things? I mean, it is incredible that we can be like this and have this conversation. But, but what's the answer? I mean, more regulation? I mean, what is it? What, what's the solution? Misinformation spreads through social media six times more powerfully than truth. So when you talk about uh, truth decay and um, the, the spread of conspiracy theories and the rest of it, it really is baked into the medium. Uh, and there's Jaron Lanier, who's a pioneer of the internet, who said that, look, negative sentiment and ideas uh, will spread more quickly and powerfully. Uh, he didn't have the math at that time, but he, he knew what he was talking about. Um, so there are so many things that we should be doing differently in, in my mind. All right, so number one, what used to be a source of unifying information for thousands of communities around the country? Local newspapers, local news media. You've had 2,000 uh, papers go out of business over the last number of years. There's actually a bill right now in Congress called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. That is a no-brainer. It's like a, what I, I joked with someone, Elizabeth Green, who founded an organization that's trying to help with this. Uh, it's a very small price to pay for a, a more functioning democracy or better functioning democracy uh, and civilization. Um, so if, if you allow thousands of towns to become local news deserts, then misinformation fills that void very, very quickly because people just turn and, and like, you know, uh, turn to these these strange new channels that are popping up. Well, that's true. Margaret Sullivan wrote a whole uh, treatise on this in, in uh, Columbia Reports. And you're right, 2,000 local newspapers. And when local newspapers are vibrant, there's much more voter engagement. But not to rain on... No, your that's, that's just number one. Uh, number two, that we've allowed these social media companies to become essentially like quasi-civilizations unto themselves. 
uh, under a 21 word uh, law or provision in a law that was written in 1996 before these companies even existed. Like the Communications Decency Act of 1996 uh, had no idea that Facebook was going to exist. <laughs> it's not like the legislators had crystal balls at that point. Uh, so you have an incredible opportunity because the, the game plan has to be to say, look, you've essentially been completely unregulated. And I find it, un I find it farcical that members of Congress are dragging in these social media CEOs and like, um, and complaining about their moderation decisions because you have to look at the ridiculousness of a private company and their team having to make the, these decisions about the public commons uh, essentially unilaterally. It's like, it, like any company in that situation is going to end up drawing a line that someone has a problem with. Uh, and so you have to mature and say, look, we did not realize in 1996 that these companies are going to, to rise to this level. Um, so let's modernize it and have standards for these companies that help address misinformation, that help address the content moderation policies. Uh, and then you have, and the, the, the tough part here, Katie, is that people trust these companies more than they trust the government at this point. So what you wanna do is you wanna build a coalition of not just the tech companies and the government, but include existing media companies, NGOs who are working on these issues, and you try and develop some standards, the tech companies actually want this stuff. They're looking around saying, why am I responsible for this? But at the same time, they love the fact that they have these you know, near trillion dollar franchises that they would prefer to, to keep unregulated. Um, so so we're, we're just operating in an archaic environment because Congress does not understand technology in the least and is writing this 96 law um, way beyond whatever was originally intended to do. But do you, do you think these companies have gotten, you know, are they too big to regulate? I mean, when you think about how many people are on Facebook, 3 billion? I mean, it's something like that. How do you actually take all this material? I mean, can you do it through AI, Andrew? Obviously, you can't through human, you know, monitoring. So what, you know, how can you keep this, you know, misinformation, all these, you know, hate groups, et cetera, kind of partaking in this kind of discourse. I don't know, how do you, do, how do you monitor it, it? So this is the painful thing that Katie, right now they're human beings who are literally being driven insane, uh, mon being mon like being assigned to monitor this information because they're looking at like venom and hate and uh, obscenity like all day. I mean, can you imagine that as a job? So the, like there's literally like a, like a collective lawsuit saying, hey, we've all lost our minds. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, they're contractors, you know, like Facebook would never have folks like be full-time employees and do this. So they contract it out. Uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest something that's going to seem dramatic, but you know, it, it's the kind of thing we should be contemplating in my opinion. Uh, so one of the major problems with social media right now is that it's ad supported and ad driven. Uh, and that's one reason why they're selling and reselling our data for billions of dollars, because that's their business model. Um, so think about uh, another business model that we all are familiar with like Netflix, where you pay a subscription fee and, and then they're not, they don't pelt you with ads the same way to the extent that they have your data. It's just to try and recommend other programming you might like. Uh, so there is a world where this is like a simplistic solution, but it, it's something that, you know, like to me would make a lot of sense is you go to Facebook and you say, look, what's that? You have 3 billion users. How many are here in the US? Let's call it 200 million, uh, maybe among different platforms. Be like, make an ad free option possible for all of the folks here uh and uh and then we will then have like a much better experience and we can you know monetize it in different ways uh but if you force companies to have an ad free model then a lot of people would voluntarily pay uh, certainly you know like you and i might <laughs> um and uh and then it ends up fundamentally changing the incentives of the companies which right now are around maximizing engagement to the hilt. Um, so if you don't have those kinds of financial incentives or incentives to sell and resell our data to advertisers, then the entire uh, experience changes. Yeah, I guess, but how would that deal with misinformation? I get that it would, you know, how would that reduce it? I is that mean that misinformation would circulate among the people who don't, can't afford sort of the subscription model and a monthly fee or an annual fee? Well, the misinformation is being fed by the, the market incentives that are built into these platforms. So what do I mean by that? 
Like, uh, let's say that you and I were not who we are, and I was just a random YouTuber. Like, my, my financial incentives very quickly become to spread conspiracy theories because I can build an audience and, and, <laughs> and, and get uh, traction that way. So if you're a platform and you no longer care about uh, uh, levels of advertising, then there, there's less of a reason for you to wind up at my, like, at my conspiracy theory peddling site. Uh, you know, like you, you wind up like a, a different, um, like a different way of, uh, uh, of essentially rewarding different types of content. Um, but to your point, which is correct, uh, like do there need to be some kind of um, guidelines around what's considered news and what's not, like more fact checking around certain things? Uh, I believe there do. Uh, and, and I believe there, there, there does need to be some increased uh, scrutiny on what gets peddled as news uh, in the U.S. Um, and that requires, again, like a heavier hand than we're accustomed to in the United States, but it's appropriate. Uh, you know, it was Roger McNamee who looked at it and said, there was a period when we let chemical companies dump chemicals in the river. And then eventually we figured out, wait a minute, that's actually really bad. <laughs> like, like, we should make some rules around that. Um, so the same thing has happened with social media, where these companies have proliferated to gargantuan sizes, and we're just now realizing that some of these effects are negative. It's completely appropriate for us to, to regulate those effects. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, some people are saying universal basic in, income is it equals socialism. Someone just wrote that. And I think that's something that you really, uh, you know, one of the tenets of your candidacy was universal, ba universal basic income. Can you quickly uh, explain that concept to people who are watching and listening? And if you still feel that that's a solution to our changing economic landscape? Well, Katie, at this point, it's not just me. It's 55% of Americans uh, because we can see what's happened during the COVID era where we've lost tens of millions of jobs. 74% uh, of Americans support cash relief. And to the person who says universal basic income equals socialism, it's capitalism where income doesn't start at zero. That uh, a country where people have more money to spend, it's good for small businesses, it's good for jobs, it's good for entrepreneurship, uh, it's good for keeping some of these towns afloat. Uh, and um, this is something that's not just me. I mean, economists have looked at the stimulus that was part of the CARES Act and said it was incredibly effective at not just alleviating poverty and extreme deprivation, but also at supporting the, the economy and keeping jobs. And, and uh, you know, what? how do you feel about the future of the Democratic Party? There seems to be this, this I was going to say this yin and yang appropriately <laughs> about, you know, uh, centrist versus more progressive members of the party. Um, and, and I think that there's some tension there. How do you see that sorting itself out? Uh I think this was a rough election for Democrats. Uh, I mean, aside from the big one, which is, thank goodness, Trump's out. Um, but Democrats were trying to figure out how many seats they were going to gain, not lose. Uh, and so that, that's a very, very tough uh, setback. And I know some of the members that lost. You know, I talked to one of them yesterday. Uh, and um, he was very disappointed, um, surprised. I think he expected to win. Um, so I think there should be some soul searching on the part of the Democratic Party around why they're not competing in places like Ohio and Iowa that were swing states that Obama won not that long ago. Uh, and then they lost both those states by eight points. Uh -huh. And a, a lot of folks in the Democratic Party are looking like looking at it saying like, well, why hunker down in places that maybe aren't as demographically appealing? Um, and to me, that is the, the grave um, miscalculation, where if you say, look, let's just give up on the Midwest or places like Ohio and Iowa and, and uh, say we're just going to head to diversifying states like Arizona and Georgia, which uh, Democrats won, uh, then you lose a, a massive opportunity to try and address why some of these places are going red. You know, like that, that has to be the challenge for the party is like, why is it that the message or the policies are not hitting home for folks that supported uh, Democratic candidates uh, eight years ago. You, you said uh, that, the, your, that Democrats, quote, 
uh, that, that the Democratic Party has, quote, taken on this role of the coastal urban elites who are more concerned about policing various cultural issues than improving their way of life that has been declining for years. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary <laughs> where, where if you go to these towns, I spend a lot of time in these towns, Katie, uh, and it's tough. You know, they're seeing their kids leave. They're seeing their neighbors uh, struggle with addiction. Uh, they're seeing the plants close. The farms get gobbled up. If you're a farmer in Iowa, like your kids might not want to get into the business. It's hard for you to compete against these mega uh, agri corps. Uh, and, and so, so then when, when uh, Democrats come and say, hey, we're, we're here to help you, they're looking around saying like, are you? Or like, what's been going on here um, where uh, the, their way of life has been getting worse, not better for quite some time under both parties. I mean, if you look at the, the average American uh, situation, healthcare costs have skyrocketed, cost of college has skyrocketed uh, and your income has stayed the same. So you're looking around saying, what the heck is going on? Uh, it, it's, it's particularly rough in some of the states and areas I, I described. And I, again, I've spent a lot of time there. And it's one reason why I'm so passionate about cash relief, because to me, that message would work. Like if you go to people in Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, or, or sorry, Iowa and Ohio and New Hampshire, why not? I'll throw them in. I love them too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and say, uh, look, this town has had a really rough go over the last number of years. We need to help fund and fuel a transition to a different kind of economy that works for you and your family in a way that they'd actually feel and appreciate. Like, I think that would be the game changer. That's why I'm, I'm pushing as hard as I am. Um, and I, I hope the Democratic Party takes it to heart. Before we go, um, someone told me not to fall asleep. I'm not falling asleep. I'm trying to look at the comments to see if there are some good questions from a lot of the smart people who follow me um, on social media. I mean, w w this COVID uh, situation is getting worse and worse. Georgia, uh, we just read, has is up 37% in the number of cases since two weeks ago. You know, obviously, it's a nightmare in states like North Dakota, South Dakota, Chicago, where my mother and where my mother-in-law and father-in-law live. It's terrible. Um, you know, it, it's just really, really gotten bad. And you know. How would you have handled it differently? I mean, and, and what do you see in the upcoming months in terms of getting this pandemic under control? I, ideally, we would have invested very heavily in containing outbreaks and contact tracing early on. Unfortunately, we missed that window and then we found ourselves in community mitigation, uh, which required large scale shutdowns and pushing people to wear masks and social distance and avoid super spreader events. Uh, we didn't go far or long enough on that. We ended up suppressing it. Um, and then now we find ourselves seven months later. Uh, and, and one of the realities we have to face, Katie, is that people uh, do experience a degree of mental fatigue uh, around some of these things. Like it's very hard to be vigilant every day for seven months. You know, it's like if you, you can imagine, I'll just speak for myself. You know, it's like, like there was a period early on when like we were very fastidious about like anything that entered the house and were, you know, scrubbing it and like the rest of it. And then now you look at it and say, oh, well, you know, you should be concerned more about objects than, or sorry, people than objects, um, which the science bears out. Uh, and, and so like that, it, it's hard for people to maintain a very, very high degree of, uh, uh, of fastidiousness um, for months on end. Um, so we're in a really rough spot now. Um, to me, cash relief would be one of the first things you do because it helps spur compliance. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of small business owners feel like they have no choice but to stay open, or a lot of folks feel like they have no choice but to go out and try and find that work or those Uber shifts or whatever it is because they think that's the only way they're going to survive. And these are even people, someone online just said to me, he knows two people that are symptomatic that are still going to work because they feel like they cannot stop working. Uh, so if, if you did put cash into people's hands, you would see better compliance, you would see higher public trust, uh, you would see more people doing things that, that help uh, slow the spread. Um, but right now it's just trying to keep the spread under a certain level while we wait for the vaccine. Uh, and certainly it was incredible news that two companies came up with effective vaccines that hopefully will uh, get out to millions of Americans in the new year. Hey, tell me a little bit about this organization before we go that you've started, Andrew. It's called Humanity Forward. 
Um, oh, thanks, Katie. <laughs> well, I, I think people, you've got a lot of fans out there and you've got uh, people who are really quite taken with when you ran for president and believe in a lot of the things you talk about. So is this, is it, I know it's a, it's a nonprofit that's dedicated to continuing the movement you inspired, but specifically what kind of things are you going to be in, engaging in? Yes. So there are two main things we're doing right now, Katie. Um, the first thing is we've distributed almost $10 million in direct economic relief to struggling families. So uh, some people donated to us and then we turned around and gave it out to uh, 20,000 folks or so and counting. Um, so there, so there's still money going out because it's hard to talk about these things um, if you're not doing it. And so for us, it's like, well, we have the capacity, so let's do it. Uh, and the second thing is we are lobbying members of Congress to pass cash relief as part of a bigger act or independently. I talk to members of Congress every single day, and many of them are very receptive. Uh, many of them are very frustrated with the inaction out of Washington. Many of them know what's going on in their communities. Uh, you know, there was a, a member of Congress from rural, rural Massachusetts who said, like, the one restaurant in the town has closed. Uh, can you imagine, like, the one restaurant in your town closing? Like, it must feel like the world is ending. Uh, that same thing in Iowa. A member um, told me the same thing there. Uh, so we're lobbying for the obvious, which is that we should be doing more for people, for families during this time. It's unconscionable what the government has allowed to happen. Uh, and we're lobbying, you know, like I call every day, like we, we amplify uh, messaging in this direction. And money does talk in Washington. So if you want to help unlock the money for families, then go to movehumanityforward.com and then help us. Like that, there was a video I posted, Katie, where it's like, if you give us money, we're going to use it to pelt members of Congress in the head until they do the right thing. Um, so that's where the, where uh, the uh, our energies are going on that side. Well, that's uh, it, it's great to talk to you. I'm, I what, before we go, I know I've said that twice, but you know, what did you learn running for president? What, what was your takeaway about either the country, about the quality of candidates, about the process? I mean, what did you think? I learned a lot. Uh, I, I'm really grateful. Um, and the warmth and love that Evelyn and I got on the trail was something that uh, you can't ever expect or anticipate. And it does change you. Uh, I think the people of America are better than uh, what our government is demonstrating right now. And there are a lot of reasons for that, Katie. Um, I do think the media is part of it. Uh, I think that there are media organizations that really do uh, elevate and heighten the polarization. Uh, I think most Americans would agree on most things um, if they're presented in neutral terms. Uh, right now, one of the problems is we've essentially charged certain phrases and terms in a way that uh, inflame people on both sides. Uh, you know, the example I'd use was um, if, if I sit down with someone in Ohio and say, hey, what do you think? Do you think drug prices are too high? They'll be like, oh yeah. You know, do you think if you lose your job, you should sell health insurance? Oh, definitely. Uh, what do you think about socialized medicine? They'll be like, oh, I hate it. You know, so like it, it's, it's that we, we've essentially um, pit people against each other uh, on these abstractions that if we were to define them better, you'd find vast, vastly higher, higher levels of support. Um, so that, that's one of the things I've learned. And I'm trying to untangle it right now still, you know, like I, I may... Um, there are a couple of roads for me to take, um, but I, I see the problems more clearly now than I did. I, I used to think the problem was that people didn't know that we could have something like universal basic income, which was Martin Luther King's vision and, you know, like should have happened years, years ago. Uh, but now I think the problem is that our leaders are not truly listening to the people um, and that there are, there are structural incentives that are keeping them from doing so, um, both on the government level and on the media level. Well. There's a lot of work to be done, and uh, I hope that they'll let you contribute in, in the way you think you can best uh, do that. And uh, Andrew, thanks thanks so much for spending some time with us. It's great to talk to you and hear your point of view. And uh, I guess uh, good luck in Georgia. Or in Georgia. Uh, tomorrow. It's great to connect with you too, Katie. I have to say, talking to you is so wild because like, you're such a pro. You're such a journalistic pro. You know, like you, you like, uh, I mean, obviously we all know, know and love you from um, you know, your years 
uh, as an anchor. Um, but like talking to you in this context, it's really, it's, it's fascinating to me because it's like, oh, I'm talking to Katie Kirk on like, in such a, like, you know, like a casual way, but you know, you, you have still like the same skills you ever had as a, uh, as a journalist. And so it's, it's actually a lot of fun. If you guys like what you see, subscribe right here.